Reagan and the prophecy of Armageddon. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus, going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the Reagan has said it as governor and as president, in his home and in the White House, over lunch, over dinner, in the car, and over the phone, to religious leaders and lobbyists, to his staff, a senator, and even to People magazine. On at least 11 occasions, Ronald Reagan has suggested that the end of the world is coming, and it may be coming soon. According to the president, the Bible predicts that this current generation may be the last generation. Armageddon, the final holocaust, may soon end human history. And the president is not alone. This is a belief shared by Reagan's friends and allies in the conservative evangelical community. Doug Weed, an author prominent among conservative evangelicals, was present in 1980 during an interview with then-candidate Reagan conducted by evangelist Jim Baker of the PTL Network. During the interview, Reagan said, quote, we may be the generation that sees Armageddon. But this was not the first time Doug Weed heard the former governor make such a remark. The best conversation that I ever had with President Reagan was the week that he announced for the presidency. Doug Weed. And that was out in California in Pacific Palisades in his home. It was a, a dinner that uh, then former governor and Mrs. Reagan were putting on, and I was invited to it, my wife and I. So we got into a discussion on uh, world events and world affairs, and then someone uh, uh, started mentioning uh, uh, the Soviet Union, and somehow, I can't even right now, I can't reconstruct how it happened, but somehow uh, eschatology and Bible prophecy came up. And uh, the new presidential candidate, then former governor of California, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, made the comment uh, that we could be the generation that sees Armageddon. And I've heard this many times after now in interviews in which I've been present, uh, which the interviewer may have been um, a Christian uh, reporter or uh, newsman pursuing that angle with him. I've heard him uh, say, this could be the generation that sees Armageddon. This very well could be that generation. Doug Weed says he has heard Reagan make such a remark many times. Bible prophecy and eschatology, or the doctrine of last things, are apparently common subjects of conversation for the president. Another apocalyptic comment was reported in the New York Times by William Sapphire during the same 1980 presidential campaign. This time in New York, addressing a group of Jewish leaders, Reagan said, quote, Israel is the only stable democracy we can rely on in a spot where Armageddon could come. Now, many people ask, where is Armageddon? How close are we to it? Billy Graham. Well, it's west of the Jordan between Galilee and Samaria in the plain of Jezreel. And Napoleon saw that great place one time, and he said this would make the greatest battlefield in the world. Well, the Bible teaches that the last great war of history will be fought in that part of the world the Middle East. Billy Graham in 1983 said, quote, it seems that all signs are pointing to Armageddon. Reagan and Graham have been friends since the 1950s. During his presidency, Reagan awarded the evangelist the Medal of Freedom, our country's highest civilian honor. And when Reagan was shot, Graham was summoned within two hours of the shooting. Another of Reagan's Armageddon remarks was reported in March of 1981 in the Los Angeles Times by Reverend Jerry Falwell. In an interview conducted by Robert Shear, Falwell asserted, All of history is reaching a climax, and I do not think, I do not think, we have 50 years left. Shear asked him, Have you ever discussed these things with Reagan, the whole question of prophecy? Does he agree with you? Falwell's response, yes, he does. He told me 
Jerry, I sometimes believe we're heading very fast for Armageddon right now. Why will this battle be fought? Jerry Falwell, who and what will draw all the nations of the world into the arena of Armageddon? They will come there because of their hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the nations led by the Antichrist will doubtless realize that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and in great glory is imminent. And it's not unreasonable to assume that they will gather in that area in Armageddon to destroy him, Christ, the Lord Jesus, at the moment of his return to earth. A foolish determination, but nonetheless, blinded by Satan himself, they will come there to do battle against the Almighty. Ronald Reagan, in March of 1983, arranged a National Security Council briefing for Jerry Falwell. So you see, Armageddon is a reality, a horrible reality, but thank God it's the end of the days of the Gentiles, for it then sets the stage for the introduction of the King, the Lord Jesus, in power and in great glory. According to conservative evangelicals, such as Falwell, Graham, and many others close to the President, the prophetic signs foretelling Armageddon and the second coming of Christ have all been realized during this current generation. And according to the Jerusalem Post, Ronald Reagan referred to these same prophetic signs in October of 1983 during a phone conversation with Tom Dine of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, a pro-Israel lobby group. The president said, quote, You know, I turn back to your ancient prophets in the Old Testament and the signs foretelling Armageddon, and I find myself wondering if, if we're the generation that's going to see that come about. I don't know if you've noted any of those prophecies lately, but believe me, they certainly describe the times we're going through. Now, if ever a generation had a right to be moved by fear... Billy Graham. ...and get right with God, it's our generation. The headlines are screaming it to us, they're preaching to us every day. Almost all Bible teachers I know are anticipating the Lord's imminent return... Jerry Falwell. And I do believe myself that we are a part of that terminal generation, that last generation that shall not pass until our Lord comes. And the signs of the times would indicate that we're approaching that glorious moment when Christ is going to come back again. So, within the belief system of conservative evangelicals, Armageddon and the Second Coming are intertwined and are prophesied to take place during this current generation. But although Reagan has specifically referred to the possibility of Armageddon coming during this current generation, and although he associates with many conservative evangelicals who espouse such a belief, does the president himself actually believe in Bible prophecy, or is he pandering to a large fundamentalist and charismatic Christian constituency? Bob Slosser is the executive vice president of the Christian Broadcasting Network, one of the largest conservative evangelical radio and television networks in the country. Slosser is also the author of a biography of the president published in 1984 entitled Reagan Inside Out. As proof of Reagan's sincerity regarding evangelical theology, Slosser points to Reagan's mother, Nell. Ronald Reagan's mother, Nell, uh, was very influential uh, on him in just about every way. Bob Slosser. Particularly influential uh, in young Reagan's uh, uh, spiritual upbringing, his Christian upbringing. He, she, uh, the Disciples of Christ, as was uh, the, uh, her denomination. She, she uh, was a faithful attendee at services, uh, a very devout woman, a Bible reader, uh, uh, thoroughly committed to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And uh, uh, so as a result of that, Reagan uh, was exposed to church going, and he was exposed to Bible reading, and, uh, and sort of just uh, a natural outworking of what you might call a, a Christian life. And uh, uh, what I see, what I have seen in, in writing this book is that uh, Reagan's... Uh, works this out in uh, in ways that often don't look religious. He doesn't talk religious. Uh, uh, in fact, he seems a little uh, a, a little embarrassed by uh, uh, ex 
extreme piety and so forth. But he works this out in what I call a, a manly, sort of Gary Cooper, Western kind of way, and uh, sometimes a little rough in his, uh, in, you know, in, in, in not, I don't mean in the terms of swearing and so forth, but rough in, uh, in, in, in his language, you know. For instance, he, he, he often, instead of saying, you know, uh, the Lord has made it plain to me I should do so and so. He's apt to say, if he's in a in a certain kind of a group, uh, uh, my first counselor told me, and and then he means the Lord when he uh, when he uses that kind of language. So he you know he he has he uh, has uh, uh, been greatly influenced uh, down uh, through the years by the teaching that he uh, received uh, from his mother in his his early life. Well, I was very fortunate. I had a mother who implanted a, a great faith in me, much more than I realized uh, at the time she was doing it. That was Ronald Reagan in 1980 during an interview with TV evangelist Jim Baker. In his biography of Reagan, Bob Slosser writes that the president's mother, quote, believed in the divine will perhaps to the point of predestination. I've always believed that we were put here for a reason, that there is a path, somehow a, a divine plan for all of us, and for each one of us. Ronald Reagan to the National Religious Broadcasters in 1982. And I've also always believed that America was set apart in a special way. To preserve our blessed land, we must look to God. Do we really think that we can have it both ways? That God will protect us in a time of crisis, even as we turn away from him in our day-to-day -day life? Maybe it's later than we think. Otis here. What we're about to hear is a historic interview. It is an exclusive opportunity that God opened up for us to interview one of the three major presidential candidates in the United States. This had come about as a result of us feeling impressed by the Holy Spirit of God to send out Western Union telegrams inviting the three major candidates uh, to make themselves available for what we described as a character audit. And so I'd like you to listen in now to the first who has responded, Governor Ronald Reagan. George Otis interviewed former Governor Ronald Reagan in 1976. One of the questions Otis asked Reagan was whether or not he was born again. I can't remember a time in my life when I uh, didn't call upon God uh, and hopefully thank him as often as I called upon him and yet yes uh, I have to believe that in my own experience there there came a time when uh, uh, there developed a new relationship and uh, and it, uh, it grew out of need and uh, so yes I would say in the sense that I understand it uh, uh, that I have had an experience that could could be described as born again. Of course, not all born again Christians believe in conservative evangelical eschatology, but all conservative evangelicals are born again. Did Reagan, however, conveniently get religion in time to run for the presidency? I've always been uh, impressed and and delighted with um, with Ronald Reagan. Pat Boone. Long before he was the president and before he was even governor of California. Uh, with his um, spiritual sensitivity, I, I had many discussions with him when we were both just entertainers, um, and our kids were in the same school. And we would stand around after uh, one of our the functions at school, in which both our children, his, of course, he and Nancy are older than Shirley and I, but but they had children that were a year or two ahead of ours in school. And uh, so we were at the same functions, and we'd stand around afterwards just talking about whatever came up, and invariably uh, our discussions would drift toward uh, the problems facing the country, what ought to be done, both political uh, decisions, governmental decisions, and 
uh, how it fit into to the divine scheme of things. And I was aware then that though we weren't quoting verses to each other, that he had a uh, framework of Bible knowledge. Facing the future with the Bible, that's a perfect theme for your convention. Ronald Reagan to the National Religious Broadcasters in 1983. I'm accused of being simplistic at times with some of the problems that confront us. But I've often wondered, within the covers of that single book are all the answers to all the problems that face us today, if we'd only look for them. I've heard Ronald Reagan for years. Tim LaHaye, author of the Bible prophecy book, The Beginning of the End. And he's been saying these things for years. This wasn't just for us here at the Religious Broadcasters. Tim, you and I were in the president's home. TV evangelist Jim Baker. Before he was the president, just right. a few months before he was president. And uh, he was saying the same things privately, was he not? Yes, he was, as a pre-candidate. Tim, what did you think when he said the Bible has all? He didn't say part of, he said has all the answers. I think he was saying what he believes. This is a man that reads the Bible. He knows many of the principles. He has charted the course of his life according to these principles. Demos? I, I knew the governor uh, when he was governor. Demos Shikarian of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. And he spoke twice to the Full Gospel Businessmen Convention before he ever was president. So he's telling what's in his heart. He's always said the same, just like he said. Were any of you in the meeting with Mr. Reagan before the election in Atlanta that I was at? Baker. There was about 10 or 15 of us. Right. We spent, I think it was almost eight hours, if I'm not mistaken, all, all told there. And James Robinson was in the meeting as well. And I mean, James put it to the president, or the president-elect, or not even president-elect at the time, he was just running for president at that time. And we sat there in our shirt sleeves with the president for eight hours. And I mean, they just, the spiritual leaders of this country just bombarded that man with every question. I, James Robinson got to the point where I was embarrassed because <laughs> he just was prying him. It, it was good. You know, I, I, James was doing right. And I'm telling you, Mr. Reagan, without a script, without anything, he had the same answers that he's giving right here in this speech. Right. He was the same man. And the thing that I was impressed with at that particular moment that the president was not to, you know, he was what he's doing. He was a moral man. He sincere. believed in these things. And sincerely, this was a part of him. And it wasn't something he had to put on and put off. Because of all the private conversations I've had with Ronald Reagan through the years, including long before he ever ran for public office. Pat Boone. Because of all the private times I've had with him, I've just always known that he was a man who sought God's will, who was determined to do God's will, either as a private citizen or as an elected official, regardless of the human cost or outcome. By dying for us, Jesus showed how far our love should be ready to go. All the way. Ronald Reagan to the National Religious Broadcasters Conference in 1984. Helping each other, believing in him, we need never be afraid. We will be part of something far more powerful, enduring, and good than all the forces here on Earth. We will be a part of paradise. Pat Boone at the SANE and RB Conference. There's only one way. One God. One book. And it's the Holy Bible that'll take you to the promised land. Has anyone stopped to consider that we might come closer to balancing the budget if all of us simply tried to live up to the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule? Malcolm Muggeridge, the brilliant English commentator, has written, the most important happening in the world today is the resurgence of Christianity in the Soviet Union, demonstrating that the whole effort sustained over 60 years to brainwash the Russian people into accepting materialism has been a fiasco. Think of it, the most awesome military machine in history. But it is no match for that one single man. Hero, strong yet tender, Prince of Peace. His name alone, Jesus, can lift our hearts, soothe our sorrows, heal our wounds, and drive away our fears. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. Oh, but the end will be destruction in the land. I'm going to depart from what I was going to say or begin with here for just a moment to tell a little story, and I hope Pat Boone won't mind. I'm going to tell it on him. 
Some years ago, when there was a subversive element that had moved into the motion picture industry in Hollywood and uh, there were great meetings that were held, there was one that was held in the Los Angeles Sports Arena. 16,000 people were there. And thousands of them up in the balconies were young people. And Pat Boone stood up and in speaking to this crowd, he said, talking of communism, that he had daughters, they were little girls then, and he said, I love them more than anything on earth, but he said, I would rather, and I felt, I know what he's going to say, and oh, you must not say that. And yet I had underestimated him. He said, I would rather that they die now believing in God than live to grow up under communism and die one day no longer believing in God. Just a kid, the words would ring inside my head for hours. They would talk and they would sing of heaven going power. I didn't know if I would want to go and leave the things and the people I know. But I'm believing now and when he comes, it's going to be a super show. Second coming is a little closer and it sounds brand new. Second coming is about to happen. It's forever true. Maybe it's later than we think. The kid is gone, but the words still ring like church bells in a tower. Now I write a song and sing about resurrection power. I'm gonna shout it out until they see. I'm gonna tell them just how it's gonna be. I'm gonna sing it out and when he comes, everybody's gonna sing with me. Second coming and we're gonna fly now, leaving it all behind. In October of 1970, then-Governor Ronald Reagan repeated to Pat Boone, George Otis, and Reverend Harold Bredesen a story told to Reagan by Billy Graham. I got a call from Pat Boone. Harold Bredesen. Pat Boone's book, A New Song, begins with the two of us on a hilltop overlooking Beverly Hills where he told the Lord that he was willing to die to his career, hate it for Christ's sake, and give it up completely rather than ever compromise again. And uh, from that point on, we became very good friends. And he called one day and he said, uh, you know, Reagan has only one day off in the six weeks gubernatorial campaign in which he is engaged. And on that day, he has invited me to his home just for an afternoon of fellowship. And when I go, I want to have George Otis on my right hand and you on my left. And so uh, we arrived there in Sacramento, and we were taken to Reagan's private home, not the governor's uh, uh, mansion. And he showed us around the place, served us cokes, and we sat down in his living room. And he said, you know, I just had a very remarkable afternoon with Billy Graham. He has a place here in California now. And uh, he shared with me a conversation he'd had with Prime Minister Adenauer, Chancellor of West Germany. The Chancellor had said, Billy, do you know what the next great event of world history is going to be? Why, well, Chancellor, I wish you'd tell me. The return of Jesus Christ. As you know, Billy, I am an ardent student of scriptures, but I've made a special study of prophetic eschatology, those prophecies that must be fulfilled before Christ comes back. And I've discovered in my studies that though many of the prophecies that must be fulfilled before he comes back have been fulfilled, some of them for centuries, today every last one of them has been or is being fulfilled. 
that all prophetic eschatology focuses on this present juncture of world history as the one in which Jesus Christ is coming back. An account of this meeting between Adenauer and Graham, as retold by Reagan, is in Bob Slosser's biography of the president. And the same meeting is also alluded to by Reagan himself during an interview with the president for People magazine in December of 1983. The unedited transcript of the interview appears in the weekly compilation of presidential documents. The president refers to a meeting between a theologian and the then head of the German government years ago when the war was over. At this meeting, the two discussed the next great news event worldwide. As a preface to this account, the president says, quote, some theologians quite some time ago were telling me, calling attention to the fact that theologians have been studying the ancient prophecies, what would portend the coming of Armageddon, and have said that never, in the time between the prophecies up until now, has there ever been a time in which so many of the prophecies are coming together. There have been times in the past when people thought the end of the world was coming, and so forth, but never anything like this. Unquote. These remarks are particularly significant in that they link, in the president's thinking, these present times to an unprecedented fulfillment of prophecy, linked again to Armageddon and the end of the world, all of which is in turn associated with the second coming, the next great news event worldwide. But an imminent second coming was discussed more than once by Reagan when he was governor of California. In an article entitled, The Reagans and Their Pastor, published in Christian Life in May of 1968, William Rose describes a meeting between Ronald Reagan, Billy Graham, and Reagan's pastor, Don Mumar. Rose writes, quote, Mumar said he has been pleasantly surprised to learn how knowledgeable the governor is on what the Bible says about the second coming of Christ. He said he and evangelist Billy Graham visited Reagan one day when the governor was in the hospital for a brief period. He said Graham and Reagan became engrossed in a discussion of Bible prophecy in relation to the signs of the times and that Reagan held his own with the noted evangelist." Unquote. When Rose asked him about this meeting, Reagan said, quote, We got into a conversation about how many of the prophecies concerning the second coming seem to be having their fulfillment at this particular time. Graham told me how world leaders who are students of the Bible and others who have studied it have come to this same conclusion, that apparently never in history have so many of the prophecies come true in such a relatively short time. After the conversation, I asked Don Mumar to send me some more material on prophecy so I could check them out in the Bible. You know I was raised on the Bible. I also taught it for a long time in Sunday school. Then Governor Reagan was familiar with Bible prophecy. Pat Boone. His lifestyle, his decisions, his priorities have always evidenced um, an awareness of, of sort of biblical and, and divine priority. And that had to come from somewhere. I think it came from his own upbringing. But also, one of the key uh, key sources, I think, for his Bible knowledge and uh, an awareness of prophecy has uh, been Herb Ellingwood, who was um, his legal secretary when he was governor. And uh, during the eight years that he was in Sacramento with the heavy load during the, 60, uh, the 70s of, um, of being governor of the most populous state where all the college unrest was, where there were so many demonstrations, draft card burnings, rebellions and all these things, plus tremendous economic, social problems, all kinds of things happening. Um, Herb Ellingwood and he spent many quiet times talking about Bible answers to these things. I can remember various conversations with uh, President Reagan when he was governor. Herb Ellingwood. In which, or during which, he uh, quoted uh, the Bible or referred to the Bible in a variety of ways. He uh, described, for example, in a meeting with me in which the entire cabinet and senior staff were present uh, when Billy Graham was a, a guest at lunch. Um, his understanding of, of biblical prophecy with regard to the coming of Jesus, 
Second coming of Jesus. Herb Ellingwood, then Governor Reagan's legal affairs secretary, now President Reagan's appointed chairman of the Merit Systems Protection Board, is talking about yet a third time that Reagan, as governor, discussed an imminent second coming. It was on June 29, 1971, that Reagan had Ellingwood arrange for Billy Graham to deliver to both houses of the California legislature a spiritual state of the state. In his speech, Graham said, quote, The appeal of communism in this world is eschatological because they have a plan for the future. The only alternate plan that I know about in the world today is the plan in the Bible. The Bible says that man is going to go from trouble to trouble and judgment to judgment, but there is going to come a day when God will intervene in the history of man and the Messiah is going to come." Unquote. After the speech, Reagan invited Graham to lunch with the cabinet and staff. According to Ellingwood, the only person there who wasn't a government official was a chairman of Graham's Sacramento Crusades, realtor Walt Hansen. Well, it is interesting at that particular luncheon, in fact, about talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Walt Hansen. Governor Ronald Reagan asked the question, well, do you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon? And what are the signs of his, of his coming, if that is the case? Whereupon Dr. Billy Graham responded to then-Governor Ronald Reagan by saying, the indication is everything that Jesus Christ is at the very door could come at any time. And uh, Governor Reagan was very much at that point impressed and went along with it. Also around that same time, Herb Ellingwood. The governor was familiar with some of the books uh, that were in this uh, area. For example, uh, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. It was a book that he had read. I've given him a lot of books, uh, and The Late Great Planet Earth was one in which uh, has been, you know, repeatedly uh, discussed. Jesus said there were certain predicted conditions Hal Lindsey. That would be like birth pangs that would increase in frequency and intensity and would herald his bringing in of a new world. Hal Lindsey is the author of The Late Great Planet Earth, a Bible prophecy book which Herb Ellingwood says Reagan has read and repeatedly discussed. Hal Lindsey has also been cited by Jerry Falwell as one of the sources for his eschatology. But what are those birth pangs that Lindsay points to, those prophecies that have come together, which Reagan mentions? Lindsay Falwell and almost every conservative evangelical see as one of the major signs the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. According to the eschatology, it is the fulfillment of this prophecy that most probably ties Armageddon to this current generation. This, then, was the ask for sign. Falwell. Shortly before his crucifixion, our Lord uttered the following words. He said, truly I say, Lindsay, the generation that sees all of the signs begin to come together will be the generation that sees them all fulfilled. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, in context, what generation was he talking about? Jesus spoke this to answer his disciples' question as to when he would come again. Israel, he said, would soon be destroyed. And when she began to bloom again, the second coming would then be very near. He was talking about the generation that would see the signs begin to come together. Do you hear what I'm saying? It is wrong to set dates, but I do believe that according to the words of our Lord, regarding that generation which shall see all these things come to pass, According to the words of our Lord, we are that generation, and we have seen in 1948 the regathering of the Jews to the land and the reformation of the Jewish nation. We are that generation. Billy Graham, in his 1953 publication, Peace with God, also pointed to the reestablishment of the state of Israel in 1948 as a sign that the end was near. He said, quote, Many scholars who read the scriptures correctly in the view of current events feel that we are living now in the latter days of life on this earth and that we have entered upon the final era, the last act of the mighty drama that started all those thousands of years ago in the Garden of Eden. There are stirrings in the Middle East. With the reestablishment of Israel as a separate nation, a sovereign state with its own currency, its own army, its own identity, the wheel has made its mighty cycle and it's coming to a full turn." End of quote. 
After the formation of Israel in 1948, the most important sign to conservative evangelicals was the reunification of the city of Jerusalem in 1967. Pat Robertson, whose writings have been quoted by President Reagan and who was once a student pastor under Reverend Harold Bredesen, is now president of the Christian Broadcasting Network, where Reagan biographer Bob Slosser also works. In his autobiography, Shouted from the Housetops, Pat Robertson pointed to the reunification of Jerusalem in 1967 as a primary sign of the end of the world. He also tied this sign to the role of the Christian Broadcasting Network, CBN. Robertson wrote, Somehow I knew that the future of CBN was intertwined with the destiny of the nation of Israel. I didn't know exactly how we would be related, but I did know that the start of construction of our headquarters building on the same day that the Six-Day War began was highly significant. The takeover of Jerusalem by the Jews during that war was a signal that the times of the Gentiles had ended. In my thinking, the ministry of CBN was an end-time ministry. Like John the Baptist, we had been called to proclaim the end of the old age and to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus Christ and the new age. In 1967, how, Lindsay? We began to see the phasing out of the times of the Gentiles. You know why? For the first time in almost 2,500 years, the Jews gained sovereign control of old Jerusalem, and they've held on to it. These same two important signs in prophetic eschatology have been cited by Ronald Reagan. During the conversation back in October of 1970 with Pat Boone, George Otis, and Harold Bredesen. And then to my great pleasure, Harold Bredesen. And uh, some little amazement, Reagan began taking off some of these prophecies that had been fulfilled. And uh, nearly all of them related to the Jew. As someone has said, the Jew is God's timepiece. And then Governor Reagan began to tick off some of these prophecies. First, that the Jew, if he was not faithful to God, would be scattered to the ends of the earth. But that having happened, God would not wash his hands of them. Before the return of his son, he would regather them to Israel. And even the method of transportation they would be using was detailed by the prophet. He said some would come by ship and others return as dove to their coats. In other words, they'd come by ship or by plane. A nation would be born in the day. None of those things have happened to any other nation. What other nation has ever been scattered to the ends of the earth and then regrouped? What other nation has, uh, that has become a politically extinct been born in a day and so forth? And, of course, he, he cited the fact that the promise that, uh, well, uh, that uh, Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles at the time of the Gentiles was fulfilled. And uh, that this prophecy was fulfilled in 1967 when Jerusalem uh, was reunited under the Israeli flag. Uh, it was quite impressive. Uh, what impressed me especially about it was the fact that I could see that Reagan had grown spiritually tremendously from the time three years earlier when he had auditioned for uh, a company I was starting at the time called Bible Voice. A good example of his full awareness of what was going on in terms of prophetic eschatology uh, was his ability to cite the very day in 1948, when Israel was reconstituted as a nation. There have been many important dates in history since Jesus ascended into heaven. Jerry Falwell. But in my opinion, the most important date during the past 20 centuries occurred on May 14, 1948. It was on that day at 4.30 p.m. that Israel officially became a nation again. Now, what is... Hal Lindsey. The most crucial sign that had to come before anything would be relevant to be a prophetic sign of the second coming. Do you know? Israel. That was it. Israel. 
Reagan is quite uh, uh, quite knowledgeable of, about the uh, the scriptures. Bob Slosser. And uh, particularly keenly interested uh, in uh, in the various parts of prophecy uh, that are that have been and are being fulfilled. For example, the kinds of things that I'm talking about. The the one clear example. Uh, that evangelical Christians believe is found in, in the Bible is uh, that uh, the you know the return of the Jews to their homeland to Palestine and then the establishment of the state of Israel and uh, the, and the, and the once again the uh, the city of Jerusalem being in the hands of the Jews and uh, uh, you know Christ referred to that as a a very significant point. That's the sort of thing that uh, Graham and Adenauer were uh, talking about, and, and, and that's also the sort of thing that uh, that uh, President Reagan uh, uh, has shown some familiarity with and, 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 some, and some interest in, the, the prophetic portions uh, of the Bible. I don't mean to suggest by that that he's trying to run the country uh, necessarily, trying to find line by line how to the Bible, how to, you know, the decisions he's going to make, but that's the sort of... Uh, Understanding that I would say that uh, that he has of the scripture and uh, could indeed perhaps affect his thinking at some time. Ronald Reagan felt the, the wonderful cadence of, of history and prophecy. George Otis marching with such beauty and such precision, and therefore felt that uh, that the book was a was a, a guide which uh, which leaders uh, ought to ought to be uh, familiarize themselves with that they uh, they might uh, more properly. Uh, be in tune and in harmony with what God says concerning the political and social expectations for uh, the immediate and, and in the years to come. And just how might Ronald Reagan's thinking be affected by Bible prophecy? And in what direction might it guide him? Perhaps the eschatology itself provides the only clue. According to it, the formation of Israel set the stage for certain specific power relationships that would be focused on the Middle East. Before the Jews were a nation, Hal Lindsey, nothing was relevant. Now when that occurred, there began to be a countdown of all kinds of prophetic signs falling into place. Because there had to be certain spheres of political power that would emerge. And now, According to the prophetic pattern, the whole world would be focused on the Middle East and particularly Israel in the last days. All of the nations would be troubled and become involved with what goes on there. We can see how that's developing at this time, fitting right into the prophetic pattern by things as contemporary as things you see in the newspaper every day. I got the impression, Harold Bredesen, of that Reagan was definitely aware of God's purposes uh, for the Mideast and uh, for that reason felt the period in which we're going through now is particularly significant since the events projected in the Bible are coming to a head right at this time. I would say Bob Slosser uh, that uh, Reagan uh, holds a biblical view of the, the Middle East, and of course that's not always completely clear uh, at any given moment in history, uh, uh, how you apply that. Uh, and uh, I would, because he holds uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, a view that would say that Israel's role in history is, uh, is definitely central and very important. Uh, I would not, however, expect him to uh, uh, to do anything uh, in, a, in a you know a political way or you know a governmental way or a leadership way uh, or in a Christian way that would uh, uh, you know that would in, uh, be unfair uh, to say the Arabs or to those uh, who are opposed to Israel. I don't believe he can do that. I believe that he, he, he fully recognizes that it's not up to him to fulfill the prophecy. It's up to God to fulfill the prophecy. But I think what he uh, has an awareness of are the signposts along the way. Now, he would not want, in my judgment, he would not, I'm not speaking for Reagan on this because I haven't talked in, uh, uh, in, in great detail with him on this. I did not have the opportunity, but I've talked with people who have. Uh, but uh, he, you know, he, I do, I would not expect 
Reagan uh, to uh, do anything that would be contrary to the revealed will of God, uh, as revealed in the scriptures. I definitely believe that Ronald Reagan Pat Boone. would make no decision that would run counter to his understanding of God's direction and what God says is going to happen and what God says what he wants to happen. I believe that Reagan is sufficiently conversant with the Bible Bredesen. and yielded to the will of God that he would not do anything that would uh, uh, frustrate or seek to frustrate the purposes of God as indicated in the scriptures. If, as Slosser, Boone, and Bredesen suggest, Reagan would not do anything contrary to the will of God as revealed in the scriptures, it becomes important to know what most conservative evangelicals see as God's will, especially as it pertains to the Mideast. According to their interpretation of the Bible, what is predicted to take place? Well, there is some consensus. Pat Robertson and Bob Slosser co-authored a book entitled The Secret Kingdom, a book from which Reagan has been known to quote. In The Secret Kingdom, Robertson writes, here is what we can expect to happen in the days, months, and years ahead. Having been regathered from the countries of the world, Israel, a unified nation living in relative security, will be invaded by a confederation from the north and the east. Indications are that this great power from the north may be the Soviet Union, for that nation occupies land specified by Ezekiel. Falwell, predicted by the prophet Ezekiel in chapters 38 and 39 of his book, which point up the soon return of our Lord. These communists are God-haters, they're Christ-rejectors, and their ultimate goal is world conquest. Some 2,600 years ago, the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel prophesied that such a nation would rise to the north of Palestine just prior to the second coming of Christ. In Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, we read that the name of this land would be Rosh. That's Ezekiel 38, verse 2, in the American Standard Version, Rosh, R-O-S-H. He continues by mentioning two cities of Rosh. These he called Meshech and Tubal. That's all in verse 2 as well. The names here are remarkably similar to Moscow and Tobolsk, the two ruling capitals of Russia today. Also, Ezekiel wrote that the land would be anti-God, Ezekiel 38, verse 3, and therefore God would be against it. He also said that Russia, or Rosh, would invade Israel in the latter days. That's verse 8. Then he said this invasion would be aided by various allies of Rosh, verses 5 and 6 of Ezekiel 38. He named those allies Iran, which we have in the past called Persia, we now call Iran, South Africa, or Ethiopia, North Africa, or Libya, Eastern Europe, called Gomer here in Ezekiel 38, and the Cossacks of southern Russia called Tagarmer in this chapter. In 38.15 of Ezekiel, the prophet describes the major part of horses in this invasion, that horses will play a very dominant role. The Cossacks, of course, have always owned and bred the largest and finest herd of horses in history. The purpose of this invasion, Ezekiel said, was to take a spoil, verse 12, chapter 38, if one but removes the first two letters from this word spoil, he soon realizes what Russia will really be after, obviously, oil. And that is where we find ourselves today. This, then, is Ezekiel's prophecy concerning Russia. Billy Graham, in Peace with God, writes, quote, We are told that Ezekiel 38 and 39 may well be describing Russia and the mighty power of communism in the great armies that shall rise and march against the Lord in the latter days. Ezekiel said three times that it would be a power to the uttermost north of Israel. How, Lindsay? Now, Russia is the mortal enemy of the state of Israel. When I was over in Israel recently, I had the privilege of talking to General Eric Sharon, the brilliant Israeli general who saved the day in the Yom Kippur War by turning the tide and actually invading Egypt against orders. 
Eric Sharon, as I talked with him, and we talked about the Middle East and the situation there, he told me, he said, well, you know, the Arab is not the real problem. The Russian is the problem. And uh, I thought I would really shock him a little bit, so I said, well, uh, General, do you realize that one of your prophets told you that 2,600 years ago? And he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye because he's quite a joker. And he laughed and he said, you're talking about Ezekiel, aren't you? And I was stunned to find out he knew about that prophecy. And he said, oh yes, he said, uh, some of my best military campaigns I got from the Bible. So he said, you know, the Bible is no mystery to us Jews. But the Russian is. As Ezekiel predicted 2,600 years ago, the mortal enemy of Israel. I believe the events are shaping up very rapidly, fulfillment of uh, Ezekiel. Harold Bredesen. Where it says that uh, Russia, Iran, Libya, Ethiopia would league up to come to descend upon Israel. Uh, it's so impressive, isn't it, that these nations are already uh, flowing together in, in their strategies. In fact, uh, when I was with the Shah of Iran on his deathbed, I told him that he did not have to berate himself for the uh, having lost the throne because this prophecy could not be fulfilled as long as Russia's worst enemy and Israel's best friend was on the throne of Iran. And uh, I believe that Reagan is conscious of this uh, section of, of the uh, scriptures and uh, that it is having a real impact on his policy. It seems that not only do Robertson, Falwell, Graham, Lindsay, and Bredesen see Russia as a biblically predetermined enemy, but so apparently did the Shah of Iran and Israeli general Ariel Sharon. Bredesen suggests that Reagan is subject to this same determinist view. Well, according to Senator Howell Heflin, a Democrat from Alabama, Ronald Reagan interprets the Bible to mean that Armageddon will take place in the Middle East and that Russia will become involved in it. The New York Times in October of 1981 reported that, after a discussion with President Reagan, Senator Heflin said, quote, We got off into the Bible a little bit. We were talking about the fact that the Middle East, according to the Bible, would be the place where Armageddon would start. The president was talking to me about the scriptures, and I was talking a little to him about the scriptures. He interprets the Bible and Armageddon to mean that Russia is going to get involved in it. Yes, Ronald Reagan uh, indeed uh, uh, is very conscious of the fact that the Bible speaks of, of Armageddon. George Otis. Ronald Reagan seemed to be uh, very cognizant of the of the of the scripture uh, as particularly as is contained in Ezekiel 38 and 39 involving that group of nations uh, like Persia, modern Iran, and Libya, and of course uh, Israel and, uh, and Assyria, uh, what had been Assyria then, and the linkage uh, somewhere downstream to, to Russia. In 1980, George Otis, then honorary chairman of Christians for Reagan, discussed Ezekiel 38 and 39 with Ronald Reagan. And uh, so as, as the various conversations took place, uh, there was uh, a great uh, uh, clarity uh, in his mind to the fact that uh, we did need to watch and, uh, and to steer all that we could do in uh, context with the fact that God had uh, foretold the, uh, the significance of the fact that that area, what we call the Holy Land, the Middle East area, is, uh, is like the stage upon which the, uh, not only the last act of time will be worked out, but also the stage of the last scene of the last act of time, and his, uh, his own reading of the scripture and his uh, being a student 
of the uh, movement and the march of of, uh, uh, of nations that play a role in the uh, particularly the Ezekiel section uh, involving uh, the Middle East uh, made him conscious of the fact that we're approaching that time uh, very rapidly. Otis maintains that the president's understanding of prophecy has influenced his rhetoric regarding the Soviet Union. It's little wonder that uh, modern observation plus his uh, grasp of the uh, of prophecy concerning uh, what we now call Russia uh, would, uh, would cause him to express uh, a description of the Kremlin's, the essence of the Kremlin's uh, thinking and behavior as a, as a condensation of evil. In a speech before the National Association of Evangelicals in 1983, Reagan called Russia an evil empire and the focus of evil in the modern world. He added that we are, quote, enjoined by scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose this evil. A freeze would reward the Soviet Union for its enormous and unparalleled military buildup. Yes, let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. For still our ancient what philosophers would call the phenomenology of evil, or as theologians would put it, the doctrine of sin. There is sin and evil in the world, and we're enjoined by Scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose it with all our might. Communism is another sad, bizarre chapter in human history whose last, last pages even now are being written. Reagan's belief that communism's last pages are even now being written is also consistent with conservative evangelical eschatology. The result of Russia's invasion of Israel is widely seen as the destruction of the Soviet Union's military forces. While some see Russia's defeat coming through a limited nuclear war with the United States, Others see God intervening, either through earthquake or nuclear blast. In any event, the invasion by and subsequent destruction of the Soviet forces is believed to be imminent. The invasion of Israel is going to be soon. We know this. Mark Wilson. I, th I think the Soviet invasion could take place. It depends on uh, Cherninko, and who's gaining a lot of powers, we're seeing, and uh, getting really the so Soviet government uh, very, very slowly moving in uh, to control, which it takes time for a new leader to come in. But I think you'll see possibly a Soviet invasion. I've heard many, many people talk about different time dates. I think you'll see it possibly, it could possibly be this fall or early next year. Mark Wilson is the national field director of Christian Voice, the largest fundamentalist lobby group in the country. In 1982, Ronald Reagan announced his prayer and school amendment before a group of Christian Voice advisory board members. Hal Lindsey is on the executive board of Christian Voice. With regard to the prophesied Soviet invasion of Israel, some conservative evangelicals see the invasion as the Battle of Armageddon. Others see Armageddon as a separate, later event. In any case, both the Soviet invasion and Armageddon are expected to take place in the Middle East. As a result, some conservative evangelicals are so convinced of the inevitability of war that they see a Mideast peace as an impossibility. In fact, they view attempts at peace with suspicion. In the wake of the 1973 Yom Kippur War, George Otis suggested that the Antichrist was peace negotiator Henry Kissinger. After the 1979 Camp David Accord, J. 
Jerry Falwell intimated that this treaty was destined to fail. In spite of the rosy and utterly unrealistic expectations by our government, this treaty will not be a lasting treaty. Jerry Falwell. We are certainly praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We certainly have the highest respect for uh, the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of Egypt. Great men, no doubt about that. And they certainly want peace. I am convinced that is true. But you and I know that there's not going to be any real peace in the Middle East until one day the Lord Jesus sits down upon the throne of David in Jerusalem. Personally, Harold Bredesen. I don't believe there's going to be a true peace in the Middle East until Jesus Christ returns. That day is coming. And for sure, you and I are going to be a part of it. But until then, there's not going to be any peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace, our Savior, returns. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars until the end. James Robison on the eve of the 1980 Washington for Jesus rally. And any attempt at man-made peace, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword, and here it is. There'll be no peace until Jesus comes. That's what the Antichrist promises. Any teaching of peace prior to his return is heresy. It's against the word of God. It's Antichrist. James Robison delivered the invocation at the first session of the 1984 Republican National Convention. Since at least 1980, Robison has supported and met with Ronald Reagan. As we were discussing in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan and myself, George Otis, the, the future of uh, there being a true peace on earth, it uh, became evident to both of us as we sat and discussed this that although the, the Bible and, uh, and common reasoning would, uh, would certainly lead us uh, all to, to labor daily to bring about peace uh, uh, for, uh, amongst nations and amongst people with all of our might. Yet uh, a true peace would never be achieved on this earth until the Prince of Peace himself comes uh, and uh, sits upon the throne of, of David on Mount Zion. But in the interim, prior to the peace believed to be brought with the second coming of Christ, conservative evangelicals often believe that the U.S. has a biblical responsibility to go to war in defense of Israel. The proper response will be to immediately go to war. Mark Wilson. Upon call, I mean, we, we must do it. We must stand behind Israel. And uh, even though we may not agree with everything the Israeli government does, I mean, uh, if you want to go from a Bible, Bible sense, uh, I think it's, you know, it's very, very clear. God's really made it clear. Those are, you know, that's just something that we, uh, I mean, that's just a basic. And, that, and that's where we need to be. Perhaps the most dramatic Bible prophecy, which has been fulfilled right in our own day, is the reemergence of Israel as a nation. George Otis interviewing Ronald Reagan in 1976. What do you feel America should, should do if ever in the future Israel was about to be destroyed by attacking enemy nations? Well, here again. We have a relationship, uh, we have a pledge to Israel, to the preservation of that nation. We have an obligation, a responsibility, and a destiny. If we ever lift our hand from that of blessing Israel, I believe that God will judge us as a nation. Falwell. I had rather have the wrath of the nations of the world than the wrath of God. However, although Falwell and others call for an absolute alliance with Israel, the Soviet invasion and Armageddon are usually predicted as part of the tribulation, a seven-year period preceding the second coming. And according to Falwell, in a pamphlet entitled Nuclear War and the Second Coming of Jesus Christ, quote, the final reason for the tribulation will be to purge Israel. During the tribulation, Dr. H. L. Wilmington, I think Israel will recognize that Jesus is their Messiah. And uh, they'll also recognize that the Antichrist is the Antichrist. As I understand, it's rather technical and uh, somewhat extended, but that the Antichrist will come into power through his ability to consolidate Western civilization. He will pretend to be a friend to Israel. And uh, at the, uh, in the middle of the tribulation, he will show his true colors. And they'll recognize that he's not the benevolent world dictator or the friend of Israel and that he will betray the seven-year covenant that he's made with, with Israel. He pretends to be their friend. He guarantees peace in the Middle East for seven years, and then they'll recognize that he is indeed the Antichrist, and uh, all hell will break loose, and many of the Jews will, will lose their lives. In fact, 
there's some theologians that uh, feel on the basis of reading Zechariah 14 that two-thirds of, uh, of the Jews will be slaughtered and difficult to know who a Jew is today but approximately 16 million Jews which means that he will kill more than Hitler killed uh, some will escape a remnant will escape but during that time then they will they will realize that the Messiah was Jesus and then when Jesus comes again uh, they will accept him as their Messiah this time. H.L. Wilmington is the director of Jerry Falwell's Liberty Home Bible Institute, which Wilmington claims is the largest evangelical correspondence school in the world. Wilmington was also Hal Lindsey's roommate at Dallas Theological Seminary. Lindsey, in his book The Rapture, writes that God has, quote, unfinished business with the Israelite people and Jerusalem. So, Lindsay, Wilmington, and Falwell see a prophesied, inevitable, and imminent purge of the Jews. Wilmington projects that more Jews will die than Hitler killed. Many Jewish leaders may be wary of these prophetic politics. The eschatology itself does not benefit Israel as much as an alignment with Israel is seen as benefiting Christians. Approaching the final battle, they are on God's side. But some Jewish leaders take a more pragmatic approach, accepting conservative evangelical support for Israel while dismissing the portions of the eschatology that are negative toward the Jews. Gerald Strober is the national director of American Friends of Tel Aviv University and a biographer of Jerry Falwell. In the March 1981 issue of Reform Judaism, Gerald Strober says, quote, I am not frightened by the evangelical eschatology because I don't expect it to work out quite that way. We may have to deal increasingly from self-interest rather than from some philosophical and ideological overview. Perhaps the most biting criticism of the relationship between evangelical eschatology and Israel comes from Dwight Wilson, surprisingly an ordained minister in the Assemblies of God the largest and perhaps most conservative denomination in the National Association of Evangelicals. These conservative evangelicals have expected and condoned anti-Semitic behavior because it was prophesied by Jesus. Dwight Wilson. Their consent, even though given while spewing pro-Zionism out the other side of their mouths, makes them blameworthy with regard to American as well as Nazi and Soviet anti-Semitism. Neither as a body nor as individuals has their cry against such inhumanity been more than a mere whimper. On the other hand, the establishment of the State of Israel has been unquestionably approved with little or no consideration of the effect on the native Arab population. Even if the right of Israel to exist as a nation is granted, the situation still demands that the decision be made on the basis of a just and moral consideration rather than merely on the grounds that it fulfills prophecy. In addition to all of this, not only do Wilmington, Lindsay, Falwell, and others believe that the purpose of the tribulation will be to purge the Jews, but they, along with a majority of conservative evangelicals, believe that Christians won't have to go through the tribulation at all. Instead, they believe that they will be raptured out, caught up in the air to be with the Lord before Armageddon. This mass Christian escape from the final Holocaust is called the rapture. You say, what's going to happen on this earth when the rapture occurs? Falwell, you'll be riding along in an automobile. You'll be the driver, perhaps. You're a Christian. There'll be several people in the automobile with you, maybe someone who is not a Christian. When the trumpet sounds, you and the other born-again believers in that automobile will be instantly caught away. You'll disappear, leaving behind only your clothing and physical things that cannot inherit eternal life. That unsaved person or persons in the automobile will suddenly be startled to find that the car is moving along without a driver and suddenly somewhere crashes. These saved people in the car have disappeared. Other cars on the highway driven by believers will suddenly be out of control and stark pandemonium will occur on that highway and every highway in the world where Christians are caught away from the driver's wheel. I think the one nation, H.L. Wilmington, that will be most affected by the rapture than probably most of the other nations put together is the United States of America. Now, uh, think of the following scenario. If the rapture would take place today, uh, Russia would be totally unaffected. 
I mean, the, pr uh, the, pr the Premier, the President, uh, members of uh, the Kremlin, they're going to be right there. But uh, if we believe uh, our president, he, he says he's born again, and I feel he is. George Bush, the vice president's born again. We have a number, uh, probably 30 percent of the uh, United States Congress uh, can identify with the born again experience of, of, a, of a Jimmy Carter. So you think of, of all the mass confusion and the unbelievable power vacuum if all these, these leaders, in political, economic, uh, as well as the religious, uh, field, the community, will be swept up. It'll be absolute uh, chaos. Now, it'll be business as usual in, in some of the socialistic countries. In Cuba, uh, Castro will still be there, probably. What a tragic thing that's going to be, because those who are left behind will then go into the tribulation period, a time of punishment and trouble and trial such as this earth has never known. And that seven-year period of time will culminate and consummate with the Battle of Armageddon. Well, there are many prophecies made in ancient times in the Bible which speak of the kind of uh, destruction that will be wrought upon the earth in the last great war before Jesus comes back. How? Lindsay. And they are perfect descriptions of a nuclear war. When the blood shall flow in the streets up to the bridles of the horses for 200 miles. An awful, horrible time. You know, I'd rather be alive right now than any other period in human history, even if I could have made the choice. Why? Because I want to see all this war and suffering? Uh-uh. No, you know why? Because I ain't going to be here. <laughs> Nuclear war and the second coming of Jesus Christ, Armageddon and the coming war with Russia. What does all this have to do and to say with and to you and me? It says this, prepare to meet thy God. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, none of this should bring fear to your heart because we're going up in the rapture before any of it occurs. But there's going to be a meeting. While a belief in the rapture itself is apparently universal within this eschatology, not all conservative evangelicals believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. That is, a rapture that occurs before the tribulation, before war in the Middle East, nuclear war, or Armageddon. A number of evangelicals believe in a mid-tribulational rapture, which is not extremely different than the pre-trib position, because it is believed that the worst will come in the second half of the tribulation period. So the mid-tribs, along with the pre-tribs, are to be raptured out before any holocaust. The post-trib position, though, is the hardest to define, in terms of the fate of believers during nuclear war or Armageddon. However, there is at least one thing that pre-tribs, mid-tribs, and post-tribs have in common. They all agree that after the Battle of Armageddon, the believers will come back to Earth with Christ and rule the world. Christians will occupy all of the most powerful positions in culture and government, and this reign will last for 1,000 years, which is known as the Millennial Kingdom of Christ. Now, the glorious thing is... Billy Graham. Jesus Christ, before the human race blows itself up, before it happens, is going to come back. And he's going to set up his kingdom, and he's going to rule, and the kingdom of God is going to be the permanent triumph. It'll be a theocracy. It'll be Christ in control. And you and I as believers will reign with him. And we have a glorious hope beyond the grave. Post-tribs like Robertson and Slosser believe that this future kingdom age already exists, to some extent, in the current human age, but that the new world is now invisible. As Pat Robertson says, there are these principles 
that underlie the natural creation right now, and they're invisible. Bob Slosser. There's an invisible world as well as this 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 visible world that we live in, and it's the it's the it's the invisible world that sort of holds up and and, and uh, I mean it's the invisible world that sort of sort of holds up and supports the, the visible world. Well, one day, you see that's going to be flip flopped, and the 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 uh, the uh, inside is going to come outside and uh, the uh, you know the, uh, the the kingdom of god is going to be completely manifest and completely seen and completely visible and that will be what we will be living in in the meantime we're living in this spiritual world that that underlies uh, the uh, the natural world so real is this invisible world writes robertson in the secret kingdom that quote when jesus comes to earth the second time things will be turned inside out and the invisible will become the visible. In his book, The Secret Kingdom, Ronald Reagan to the National Religious Broadcasters in 1984. Pat Robertson told us, there can be peace, there can be plenty, there can be freedom. They will come the minute human beings accept the principles of the invisible world and begin to live by them in the visible world. There's a new world coming, writes Robertson, and we already know its principles. These are the same principles of the invisible world which Reagan cites. And according to Robertson, these principles will, quote, change the world as we know it and prepare the way for the new one, even speeding its arrival. Ronald Reagan does recognize the fact that uh, this nation has a, a unique opportunity uh, to have an influence upon the coming of the kingdom age. George Otis and is uh, aware of the fact that the, the strength of the United States, its, its ability to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, allow its people uh, to, uh, to fund uh, the uh, spreading of, uh, of, of the things that, uh, that are uh, consistent with what God asks us to do, uh, would uh, inherently have a tremendous influence upon the timing of, of, uh, of, of Christ's return. Uh, it's clear that this is in the forefront of his mind, the fact that the, the pulpit which he has and the nation uh, on which it rests uh, uh, should essentially be a, a, a moral and spiritual uh, strength to the whole world and influence the, uh, the, uh, the dawn of, uh, of the kingdom age. So, Otis, a pre-trib, and Slosser and Robertson, both post-trib, believe it is humanly possible to influence the coming of the kingdom age to speed its arrival. Otis believes that Reagan is aware that as president, he can have a tremendous impact on the end of civilization and the arrival of the new world. But it is important to note that for most conservative evangelicals, the new world is not synonymous with a new planet. Though many predict nuclear wars prior to the second coming, these are seen as limited nuclear wars. For only after the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign of Christ, is God to use nuclear power to blow up this planet and replace it with eternity. God says, I'm not going to let the human race blow up in an atomic war. Billy Graham. I'm going to stop it and I'm going to save for the elect's sake. That's why it's so important for believers, even though we're a small minority, for our sake, the human race will be saved. We believe that if Jesus came today, and no man knows the day or the hour when the Lord is coming, but if he came today, and he could, Jerry Falwell, then there is at least 1,007 years yet to be lived out upon this planet. Seven years of tribulation, 1,000 years of the kingdom reign of Christ, the millennium. So no one can destroy this planet for at least another 1,007 years. If Jesus were to come 10 years from today, then add that 10 years to the 1,007 years, and obviously, there are at least 1,017 years of use, and so on. So we don't need to march out in the streets with the peaceniks and the freezniks, nor do we have to go to bed at night w wondering if someone's going to push the button and destroy the planet between now and, and, and sunrise. There is something else that all conservative evangelicals seem to have in common. They do not fear war in the Middle East, nuclear warfare, or the Battle of Armageddon. They rejoice in all of it. For these are all signs of their future reign in the millennial kingdom on earth and with Christ in heaven for all eternity. Hey, it's great being a Christian. We have a wonderful future ahead. The fact of Christ coming back should be of great comfort to every believer in the world. 
We've got a hope. We've got an eschatology. We've got a program. We've got a future. The future belongs to us. attempt by Falwell and others to predict the future and then suggest how one ought to live in light of those predictions has a long history and often a very sad one and often very tragic. Gerald Shepard, professor of Old Testament at Union Theological Seminary. The Crusades would be one good example of a Christian holy war that would speed up the second coming by laying claim to history. People began to move back to Palestine to prepare the Holy Land based on prophetic promises, occupying the land in a fashion that prepares it for the second coming. That attempt to speed up the second coming, to manipulate the future by use of arms and, and uh, one's possessions, had disastrous consequences for Jews and for people in general that participated in that kind of political movement. I'm a child of the King and my father is the Lord. It is salvation, and I wield a mighty sword. Every battle, every victory has been won. For I share the power of God's own risen Son. That kind of attempt is not unusual in the history of Judaism and Christianity, but one which we should be cautious about, and I think leery of. We should learn the lessons of the past rather than simply repeat them again. Some observers, such as journalist Ronnie Duggar, think what Reagan has said about the end of the world, his apocalyptic language itself, could have disastrous consequences. The more people think, especially leaders of the superpowers think that nuclear war is coming, the likelier it will come. Ronnie Duggar. The likelier they think it is, the likelier it is. Isn't it already true as a result of this subject? Because the leaders of both sides are watching each other carefully. That President Reagan has told the Soviet Union as well as the rest of the world that he thinks Armageddon could come in this generation, may well come, could start in the Middle East. And doesn't that have to mean to the other side that he might be predisposed to see events there as precursors of such a God-ordained cataclysm? I think what worries me the most when Ronald Reagan panders and perhaps even believes what people like Billy Graham Hal Lindsey, Harold Bredesen, Pat Robertson, and Jerry Falwell are saying about this generation being the last one prior to the imminent second coming. Gerald Shepard. I think what bothers me the most is not simply that they believe that this is the last generation. In one sense, Jonathan Shell has already suggested this may be the last generation in terms of just this sheer numbers of nuclear warheads that allow for a certain accidental factor to intrude and threaten our own time. However, it's one thing to bemoan the fact that we have taken the risk of destroying this generation. It's another to see that fact as a glorious sign of the imminent second coming of Jesus Christ and then use that information in order to evaluate the relation of nations to one another, to decide which nations are going to participate in which final war, to decide who we should align ourselves with now in anticipation of Armageddon. That kind of thinking and using biblical prophecy or pandering of people who use biblical prophecy in such a fashion, to me, is the kind of thing presidents cannot afford to participate in. It's a misuse of mes a message of hope in terms of a disaster scenario that could lead to very bad public decisions about our conduct in the world. It's bad policy making, poor Christianity, and a threat to the human race. Maybe it's later than we think.
host and producer of Ronald Reagan and the Prophecy of Armageddon, I would like to thank Larry Jones for his research and other assistance, and radio station WBAI-FM, where this documentary was produced. The distribution of this program was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through National Public Radio's Satellite Program Development Fund. Ronald Reagan and the Prophecy of Armageddon was produced by Joe Cumo, who is solely responsible for its content. Cassette copies of this program are available by writing to me, Joe Cumo, C-U-O-M-O, care of WBAI, 505 8th Avenue, New York City, 10018. That's Joe, C-U-O-M-O, care of WBAI, 505 8th Avenue, New York City, 10018, for cassette copies of Ronald Reagan and the Prophecy of Armageddon. The truth is, politics and morality are inseparable. Religion and politics are necessarily related. Ronald Reagan to the Dallas Republican Host Committee Prayer Breakfast in 1984. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. And that's it for Ronald Reagan and the Prophecy of Armageddon, produced by Joe Kumo. You're listening to KUSP 88.9 in the Monterey Bay and Salinas Valley area, and 90.3 in Los Gatos, Saratoga, and Campbell. This has been the Sunday Night Special. At 11 o'clock, Jeff Thorpe.